What's good, YouTube? It's your boy Leo coming to you guys with yet another video. Coming to you guys today with another reaction. Today, we're checking out 10 worst WWE matches of 2013. We recently have been doing a series where we've been checking out the uh, previous matches from different years. We, we started at 2014 and went up to 2023. Um, so, we're kind of going back in time a little bit. So, it's kind of seeming like a little bit out of place. So, I apologize for that. But, 2013 was a very... Uh, how would I put it? Interesting year. I mean, we did see the um, the titles kind of merge. The WWE Championship and the World Heavyweight Championship merge uh, towards the end of the year. So, we had that. We did see uh, The Rock beat CM Punk for the WWE Championship in this 434-day reign as champion. So, we had some um, moments that did happen throughout the year. But, we're going to check out and see... What does Cultaholic deem worse WWE match of 2013? So let's get into it. WWE in 2013 was dominated by the story of one man. He debuted for the company as part of NXT, won a major title in a triple threat match, and is famous for sporting a very dashing beard. That's right, 2013 was the year of Curtis Axel. After beating the Miz and Wade Barrett for the Intercontinental Championship, Axel went on to... Wait a second. Daniel who? Oh yeah, that guy. Daniel Bryan's fairy tail rise to the top got properly underway in 2013 when mm -hmm. Randy Orton cashed in on the American Dragon at SummerSlam. Yeah. Fans were disappointed that night when their hero lost his championship mere minutes after he won it, but at least that wasn't the only thing they were disappointed by in 2013. WWE was still in a weird halfway house this year, slowly moving away from the cartoonish awfulness of the early 2010s, but with enough of that left over to produce some total stinkers across the year. So get your nose pegs ready because we're about to sniff them out. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling and these are the 10 worst WWE matches of 2013. Join us. Number 10, John Cena versus The Rock at WrestleMania 29. WrestleMania I, I wasn't a fan of this one. I'm not a fan of this one compared to the one they had the previous year and I feel like this is one of those matches that they was, it was built up to be once in a lifetime, and it should have stayed that way. But instead, they chose to do twice in a lifetime. Um, you had two of your biggest stars go at it. And I'm, and I'm not going to sit up here and say, like, that wasn't going to be a good match. Well, why wouldn't you say that? But, like, the story and then, like, the promos that they could have were really going to be good. But John Cena kind of killed The Rock on the promos, kind of talking about his promos being written on his arm and everything like that. So... You did have that that part that played a part as well, but I think when you look at your two biggest stars, those were your two biggest stars of all time at that point. Um, so I think the thing is, I didn't think people really cared because we wanted to see something different, and they chose to do something we already seen before, and the match didn't really live up to the hype at all compared to that they did last year. WrestleMania 28 is probably like their best match. 29 was not a great show. Sure, it had CM Punk versus The Undertaker, but it also had Alberto Del Rio versus <laughs> Jack Swagger and a P. Diddy concert. Oh, Come at me, Diddy heads. Oh, no. Perhaps oh, the no. most underwhelming match of the night, though, was the main event, a once-in-a-generation clash between The Rock and John Cena. But wait, hang on, didn't those two have a once-in-a-generation clash the year before, or did WWE lie to us? They wouldn't, would they? Unfortunately, the marketing for WrestleMania 28 turned out to be a giant pork pie. The entire show was sold around the idea of Cena versus Rock being once in a lifetime, but it turns out that the lifetime the company meant was that of a mayfly. Hardly anybody had the desire to see these two wrestle again, especially yeah. not for the WWE title, and especially not in the main event of WrestleMania. Yeah, kind of this match if was basically just a less good version of the 28 one, ending in predictably boring fashion when Cena pinned Rocky to win the belt in a rather forced torch passing moment. You can see why CM Punk had so much to complain about. At least nobody bit Cena backstage though. That we know of. Number 9. One of the That's things the students love about culinary school online with the Scopier really... I'm sorry. is the toolkit. He should have made a that Our one. students can receive Eva Marie, Jojo and the Oh lord. This this is just god awful. This was how your women's division was looking in 2013. Not good. 
Talia vs Oksana, Alicia Fox and Rosa Mendez on Raw. Jojo Offerman served as NXT's ring announcer in 2015 and then Raw's ring announcer from 2016 to 2018. Talk about a downgrade. But did you know she used to be a wrestler too? Well, she did and she made her debut in this match right here. Although I don't actually really know what she did in it. This very short, very inconsequential six-woman tag from Raw featured some of the least polished women's wrestlers the company has ever had. They put on what would have been considered a fine match for the time, but watching it now is torturous in spite of its brevity. Basically, nothing exciting happens at all, with the finish of Natty tapping out Foxy serving as an alarm clock to wake up everyone watching. What's more, the new stars in this match, Eva Marie and Jojo, barely do anything. I don't even know if Jojo actually got tagged in, and I don't really care. The epitome of the piss break concept that dogged women wrestling in WWE for years, this match would have probably just about escaped this list if it wasn't for JoJo's baffling involvement. Or lack thereof. Number 8. Mark Henry vs Damian Sandow on Raw Damian Sandow had a rough old time in 2013, and we will get to the main reason for that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's gonna, he's gonna talk about it. Him winning the money in the bank, it was cool on the, on the surface just because it would have helped his character. To be more hated, but they didn't do anything with the briefcase or him uh, potentially being a world champion. And it kind of makes you look back on it. It's like, what was the point of giving him the money in the bank if he wasn't going to do anything with it? Or if they didn't have really have concrete plans for him to cash in successfully. So it kind of felt like it was just a waste of everybody's time in the grand scheme of things in just a little bit. As the year was coming to a close, I bet he was really looking forward to it all being over so that he could go home to his mansion, pour himself a nice glass of whiskey, and do whatever it is that smart people do at Christmas. I assume play Trivial Pursuit or something. Instead though, on the December 23rd, 2013 episode of Raw, WWE had him dress up like Father Christmas and get obliterated by Mark Henry. Bar humbug. In what was dubbed the Battle for Christmas, Sandow played the part of Bad stupid. Santa, presumably like because Billy Bob Thornton wasn't available. Like Henry was in the role of Good Santa, and if he lost this match, then Christmas would be cancelled for everyone. Except it wouldn't be because it's just a wrestling match. I'm pretty sure that Vince McMahon didn't actually have the authority to cancel yeah. Christmas. Pretty sure, not fully sure, mind. He might have tried, you know. The match was a bog-standard comedy weapons match, you know the sort, that saw Sandow get battered like a cod. In the end, Henry blasted Sandow with a fire extinguisher to end this pointless encounter and put the intellectual savior of the masses out of his misery. Number seven, Tensai versus Titus O'Neil on main events. Did you guys know that- Remember Lord Tensai? I mean, a lot of people would look at him as remember him as A-Train, but it is what it is. Main event is still a thing. You can watch it on the WWE Network. They actually still make it, I promise. Pretty unbelievable, barely. right? Because it's been completely pointless as far back as the 30th of January 2013. That is, of course, the date that the show was closed out by a mouth-watering clash between Titus O'Neil and Lord Tensai. Mouth-watering in the sense that you've fallen asleep and you're dribbling everywhere. For 13 hideous minutes, the two big men hit each other, minutes. then moved around, then hit each oh, other nah. again, then maybe nah. they would tease an actual power move or a proper spot before hitting each other once more. It just dragged on and on and on, and not even a run-in from Brodus Clay and the Funkadactyls could make it interesting. I say that like having Cameron or Tyrus present has ever made anything more interesting. Fortunately, this match was ultimately harmless because only about three people ever watched main events. Still, it was taped before SmackDown in those days, so pity the poor souls who had to sit through this painfully boring blunder in order to get to the blue show. Number six. UFC 308 yeah, via ESPNplus.com slash PPV. Don't really care. Randy Wasad really and Billy just really released their new sweet cake ball breakfast bowl and we had to give it a try. And then doing spicy adobo the spicy adobo sauce. Show. This is Total Divas vs. True Divas at Survivor Series. Oh, no. Total Divas was a reality show following the lives of WWE's female performers that aired from 2013 to 2019. Highlights of the show include okay, Paige guess, pretending to I feed really Natalia don't. hash brownies, Didn't Natalia really learning to climb a ladder, and Natalia peeing herself during a match. Honestly, Natty, what did we do to deserve you? And the Anvil's daughter was one of the names involved in this match from Survivor Series. Actually, calling it a match is perhaps 
perhaps a bit much. It was more of an advert as its sole purpose was to promote Total Divas. The teams consisted of women who were on the show and women who weren't, with the perpetual anti-diva AJ Lee leading the true Divas team. And what did AJ get for standing up against trashy reality TV? Why, she got submitted by Natalia, of course. No word on what the state of Natty's bladder was during this sequence. Hey, it was yo. just a nothing match with eliminations happening way too easily and quickly to care. Whilst it probably didn't deserve the Wrestling Observer Newsletter's Worst Worked Match of the Year award, it was still pretty naff. Hopefully it persuaded some people to watch Total Divas, otherwise this whole thing would have been a giant waste of time. Actually, it was a waste of time anyway, obviously. Number 5. Fandango and Summer Rae vs The Great Carly and Natalia at Hell in a Cell Sticking with Natalia now, and a match pretty much during the time when they were trying to do this romance angle between Greg Carly and, and Natalia, I, I did not care about that at all. I really didn't. I, I, I really, I think the Greg Carly, his best work was when he was heel being world champion, but then they made him be this Punjabi playboy. I, I, I couldn't get invested in the character. I, I really didn't care about that. And his stock kind of just went downhill after that, I feel like that she was probably the best part of. Although when you look at those involved, you'll realize that she really wasn't up against much. No offense, Dango. During a bout between sexy ballroom dancer Fandango and sexy lumbering tree man, the great Carly, Natalia got into a fight with Dango's valet slash dance partner, Summer Rae. This led to a mixed tag team match at Hell in a Cell, with Summer making her main roster in ring debut. And boy, could you tell. Summer just struggled to click in this match, taking a very long time to connect with any of her moves, often looking lost and confused. Natalia did her best to work with her, but there was really only so much she could do. As for Carly, well, he could barely walk without falling over, let alone have a decent match. Honestly, it would have probably been better if WWE just let Dango wrestle Natty. We did get a glimpse of that when she went to put the sharpshooter on him, but sadly, the rest of the match was unentertaining, clumsy dross. Oh, and Hornswoggle was at ringside for some reason. Always makes everything better, Hornswoggle. Number four, Mark Henry versus Ryback at WrestleMania 29. A match so Yeah, I didn't care for this match either. We had a it's crazy just looking back at this how bad a lot of these matches were in 2013. I think Ryback was having other plan. I think the plan and the thing is, Ryback was literally the runner up in the Royal Rumble. I feel like they could have done something else. Maybe you put him in the title picture. Not for the WWE Championship or World Heavy Championship, of course, but you could have at least gotten away with maybe having him go for the US or IC during this time. I think especially the US, because I don't think the US was really doing as much as of at that around this time. Cause I think at this time, he was a babyface still. So Brightback was still a babyface. He didn't turn heel until I think the night after WrestleMania. So you could have gotten away with doing him. And maybe like a Cesaro or something, because I think Cesaro was still a U.S. champion. You could have made that for the title, and I think it would have been a better match than him versus Mark Henry, which really didn't do anything. And then it kind of halted his momentum, because I think he lost to uh, him as well. So um, it didn't do him any favors in the long run. Sold on the idea of two monsters going head to head, this encounter from WrestleMania ironically ended up being a monstrosity itself. In a tale as old as wrestling time, two of the biggest men WWE had on the roster, the big guy Ryback and the world's strongest man Mark Henry, were put in the ring with each other like two giant bulls ready to fight it out to the death. Unfortunately, the only thing that died during this match was the audience's interest. Henry took 90% of the match, utilizing offense that would have been deemed passe in 1981. We're talking clotheslines, body slams, bear hugs. A bear hug in 2013 at WrestleMania? Come on, Mark, you're better than this. The sole highlight of the match came when Ryback picked Henry up for the shell shocked, which genuinely got a huge pop from the crowd. This didn't last, though, as Henry just flopped down on top of his opponent and pinned him for the win. Great. Here was a young guy who six months previously had been in the WWE Championship pitch losing to a man who had been in the company since the mid-90s. This was just a bad showing all round and the perfect example of the worst kind of big man wrestling. Number three, John Cena versus Damian Sandow on Raw. This Remem match between John Cena and Damian Sandow should have been so much better, but in reality, this ruined Damian Sandow as potentially being a main eventer. It ruined him because they made him look like a joke against John Cena even though John Cena was injured, and they still couldn't, didn't put him over. 
They did. Remember Damien Sandow everyone. dressing up as Santa Claus from earlier in this list? Well, this match is the reason that that happened. At Money in the Bank, Sandow won the SmackDown briefcase, meaning that he was entitled to a World Heavyweight Championship match at any time of his choosing. That time came on the October 28, 2013 edition of Raw, when he chose to strike a prone John Cena. After teasing a cash-in, Sandow attacked the already injured arm of the champion, smashing it multiple times with his briefcase and driving him shoulder first into the ring post. He then cashed in for realsies and the title match was on. Sandow hit the champ with everything, including his finisher. However, as he is one to do, Super Cena powered through the pain and put Damien down with a single AA. Sandow never recovered from this, coming nope. nowhere close to the main event ever again. In one fell swoop, Sandow went from being a fantastic heel with serious upper mid card potential to an under card joke with one of the least appealing records in wrestling history. Number See, they ruined it. They ruined his entire character. He had all the potential to be something Two, really Two, Bray nice. Wyatt versus Kane at some This one on paper it would have was cool on paper, but in Matt in, in the ring it wasn't. Like I think this was like the debut pay-per-view for a uh, Bray Wyatt cuz I think this is an inferno match. And the match just didn't hit. It didn't deliver, in my personal opinion. I'm a slam. We are going back to where it all began for the enigma that is Bray Wyatt. Well, unless you count his Husky Harris days, which we don't. In July of 2013, <laughs> the Wyatt family made their main roster debut with a vicious attack on Kane. Wyatt, Harper, and Rowan continued to assault the Big Red Machine over the following weeks until the future mayor of Knox County decided that enough was enough and a match was made for SummerSlam. It was a Ring of Fire match, which is like an Inferno match, except you don't actually have to set your opponent on fire to win. You know, the part that actually makes the match exciting. Exactly. In this version of the gimmick, Wyatt and Kane plodded around a ring surrounded by flames for eight agonizing minutes. Neither man could leave the ring, nor could they make use of the apron or ropes, which severely limited what they could actually do. Bray won in the end, which was the right call considering yeah. this was his first match, but it was hardly the shining showcase that fans wanted from the character. Thankfully, this was the last time Bray would have a stupid match in Involving flames. Isn't that right, 2020 Randy Orton? Number one, Randy Orton versus The Big Show at Survivor. A match that nobody cared about. People wanted this to see Daniel Bryan, and they gave us The Big Show. The fact that they tried to make The Big Show a main event in 2013, the fact that they tried to make The Big Show a, a huge baby face in 2013, when we knew nobody cared about it, and even though he was trying to take the side of Daniel Bryan, which I was not mad at, but but still, nobody cared. People didn't care to see this match. People didn't care to see the Big Show compete. Nobody cared this, about the idea of him becoming a WWE champion. No one cared about it whatsoever. A series. Big Show in a world title main event in 2013. Yep, this really happened. Basically, WWE management saw that Daniel Bryan was getting over with the whole yes thing, but they didn't want to push Bryan because he wasn't their idea of a top star. Mm -hmm. So they decided to take the yes chant and transplant it onto someone else. What could possibly go wrong? Paul White was thrust into the title picture as the company appointed man of the people, pretending to ignore the sea of Daniel Bryan. Brian chance as he waged war against the authority. This all led to this title match with Orton, which lasted a whopping 11 minutes and only featured about 11 different wrestling moves. No one believed that Show was actually going to win no. this match, and thankfully they were right. The match was predictable. Because you imagine if they would have done done that, that would have just made things a whole lot worse, in my personal opinion. And like he said. They were trying to keep Daniel Bryan from getting over. Even though he was getting over, they didn't want to push him because he was not what they wanted as being a main event player. They want what they were looking for as being like their next top star. So they were pretty much trying to hold him back at this point. But unfortunately, that was not the case because they couldn't keep doing that. So they had no choice but to push him and it and they uh, put the title on him at Mania. Unfortunately, his title reign was cut short because of injuries. Um, that's always been the main thing with Dan da Daniel Bryan or Bryan Danson. Um, he's always able to get to these top spots, but it seems like 
injury always seems to follow it, and it, it just keeps him from having these long title reigns. Well, outside of his heel run, which was really good, by the way, um, outside of that, he's been kind of just hit with the injury bug for some and everything like that. But comment down below, let me know. What match do you deem as worst match of 2013? If it was on the list, let me know what it was and why. And if it wasn't on this list, let me know what it should have been and why do you think it's the worst match of 2013. Um, super kick that like button. Helps my channel gets pushed across the platform so more people can see what I'm doing here on YouTube. Superman punch that post notification bell. So every time I post a new video, where's a reaction video, rant video, live stream. Any type of video, you can be in the loop of things when I do drop a video and speed the subscribe button. We're on the road to 350 subscribers, but the ultimate goal is 10K. Like I said, in every one of my videos, when I do hit 10K, I will do a giveaway. One of my lucky subscribers will have the opportunity to win a WWE Championship from WWE Shop. So if you want to be a part of that giveaway and be that potential subscriber that does win, subscribe to the channel. It's absolutely free. You can always change your mind in the future. But why would you want to do that? I'm trying to give you guys daily wrestling content. The grind does not stop. Um, but with that being said, hope everyone has a great day, a great week, and I'll see you guys in the next video.